I have never felt safe or protected in my position, especially within the House of Commons. Tonight, a not-so-fond farewell. The rookie MP for Nunavut outlines her reasons for not seeking a second term. It does, I think, rattle the confidence of communities when they can get so far in discussions with the DFO only to have them about face the last minute. They thought they were making progress on treaty fishing rights, so why did Canada turn away? It's our responsibility to take care of our people, and it's our responsibility to take care of our environment. And cleaning up the core in downtown Winnipeg. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Leaders from the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and Halesack Nation announced today new developments in the human rights complaint by a Halesack grandfather and his granddaughter who were detained at a Vancouver BMO bank back in 2019. Lee Wilson explains. CCTV footage of Vancouver Police Department officers putting handcuffs on Maxwell Johnson and his 12-year-old granddaughter on a busy Vancouver street has been shared publicly for the first time. In 2019, VPD responded to a 911 call from a Bank of Montreal branch where Johnson and his granddaughter were suspected of committing fraud over the use of an Indian status card in an attempt to open the girl's first bank account. Today, in an online press conference giving an update on the incident, Maxwell Johnson said the past two years have been hard, but they will move forward in his fight to create change within the VPD. I, this, I know deep down in my heart, I know this is something that needs to be done not only for my family, but for our community and other First Nations people and other people of color. And um, just want to thank everybody for their outgoing support. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Last year, Johnson and his granddaughter filed a BC human rights case against VPD, alleging they were racially profiled, which led to their detainment. In early 2021, Vancouver Police Department responded, denying discrimination. We reached out to the Vancouver Police Department. They stated they could not comment due to the incident being under review with the Office of Police Complaints Commissioner. At the press conference, lawyer and advocate Mary Ellen Turpel LaFond said she is applying for an intervention in the human rights case this week on behalf of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. So that we can be sure that the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal has all of the information that might be helpful for them to understand the situation and understand the level of concern that the Chiefs of British Columbia have and the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs has about this situation. Grand Chief Stuart Phillip of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs had fiery words for the treatment of Johnson and his granddaughter. Their leadership is calling for change from the VPD in their treatment of all people of color. We totally condemn the VPD. They have a long record of, of racism, abuse to people of color, of uh, not defending the fundamental human rights of people of color. The Halsic leadership supports their members, Maxwell Johnson and his granddaughter, and their human rights fight. Yeah, we, we don't agree you know, with uh, statements uh, being made that it does not exist within the Vancouver Police Department. It uh, is very alive and, you know, this is something that uh, why we're, we're here today to stand up, you know, against that and, and make sure that we can do everything that we can to, to stop it and, and make those changes that need to be made. They also shared a Strongest Cedar campaign, which brings awareness about fighting racism and highlights the story of the case. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. Last night was a chance for members of Parliament who aren't running again in the next election to say goodbye. For the most part, it was about cherished memories in the Commons and thanking colleagues. But then the NDP MP for Nunavut got her chance to speak, and Mumala Kakak did not mince words. I have never felt safe or protected in my position, especially within the House of Commons. Often having pep talks with myself in the elevator or taking a moment in the bathroom stall to maintain my composure. When I walk through these doors, not only am I reminded of the clear colonial house on fire I am willingly walking into, I am already in survival mode. Since being elected, I expect to be stopped by security at my workplace. I've had security jog after me down hallways. 
nearly put their hands on me and racial profile me. People don't like me don't belong here in the federal institution. I'm a human being who wants to use this institution to help people, but the reality is that this institution and the country has been created off the backs, trauma, and displacement of Indigenous people. The Vancouver couple that flew to a remote Yukon community in order to get early access to the Moderna vaccine, well, they had their day in court. Sarah Connors has the details. In January, wealthy Vancouverite couple Rodney and E. Katrina Baker made headlines when they flew into the remote community of Beaver Creek so they could skip the line for their COVID vaccinations. They have now both pleaded guilty to failing to self-isolate and for failing to follow their signed declaration that they would self-isolate in Whitehorse for 14 days. The pair appeared via video conference but did not address the court. During the proceedings, it was revealed the Bakers are sorry for their actions and they have donated $5,000 each to COVAX, a global vaccine organization. During their plea hearing, White River First Nation member Janet Vandermeer read a community impact statement asking the Bakers to educate themselves about their actions. Judge Michael Cousins also addressed the Bakers and asked them to consider reaching out to the community. The couple were sentenced under a joint submission, meaning both the Crown and the Bakers' lawyer agreed on the sentence. Vandermeer says she's happy with the judge's recommendation, but disappointed there isn't jail time. I was pleasantly surprised and pleased on how the judge handled the situation today and, and his comments that he made. Disappointed, as per usual with the Yukon government, uh, working so closely with the defense, um, to put a joint statement in. I think that was very unfortunate, but again, not unexpected. The Bakers will pay the maximum under Yukon Civil Emergencies Measures Act, which is $500 plus a $75 surcharge for each offense, totaling $2,300. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Thanks, Sarah. Well, next in our series called uh, Stories of Survival, APTN's Tina House meets with a survivor who attended the Kamloops Indian Residential School as a day scholar. She shares her heartbreaking memories with us. It's not easy for Joanne Goffertson walking through these halls at her former residential school in Kamloops, B.C. She attended here as a day scholar and says her memories of the past have been hard to forget. If the day scholars got sick, we would go, depending how old you are, but we're mostly juniors, so we go on that top floor and there was a bed usually closest to the door where we'd sleep and or, you know, go to to the infirmary or whatever. Gottfriedson says that day scholars across Canada attended residential schools every day, getting the exact same education, food and treatment as other Indigenous kids who had to live in the residential schools. But they were allowed to go home every night. Gottfriedson says they suffered the same way too. Uh, we weren't safe just because we didn't sleep here. Joanne says day scholars were looked down upon not only from the priests and nuns, but other students as well, so it made it more difficult. She also says she blocked out much of her childhood, but does remember what happened in the back room in the chapel. And that's where the priest molested me in that room. And because, you know, we had to go to catechism, so he would pick and choose his helpers, and his helpers would go back there. How old were you? I was seven and eight. Did you tell your parents? No, nope, because... My parents were prestigious people. My dad was a chief. My mom was an advocate for our, our people's rights. And he always said, don't say anything, because she used to come to our home. We had to sit there, offer him coffee, and treat him with respect. Joanne has since undergone years of regression counseling and attended the Choices program to heal from her abuse, but it affected her in other ways as she grew up. That part of it, and I feel bad about it to this day, is that every person, every man that came into my life paid the price. And 
I couldn't commit. I'm, I was married three times. And even though I was cultural and spiritual, there was a time in my life that because of that shame, I did indulge in alcohol. You know, I was a, I'd work all the time. I raised my kids by myself. And on weekends, I would drink. Now sober and despite her trauma, she has risen up as a leader in fighting for day scholars like herself to receive the same recognition as the residential school survivors. And just recently, the federal government reached a settlement with them. Canada had the goal, the goal to kill the Indian in us in 150 years. It's going to take our people 150 years. But because we're so strong, We'll probably survive again, but I don't want to look at it being a survivor. I want to be a warrior towards justice and wellness and healing. And our people are resilient people. Joanne Godfordson is a testament to the strength and will to survive this dark chapter in Canadian history. Tina House, APTN National News, to Kamloops. Thanks, Joanne, for sharing that with us. Well, we need to take a break, but when we come back, a new battle over fishing has emerged on the East Coast involving a Mi'kmaq community and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. We'll tell you all about that when we come back. Welcome back. According to court documents and emails obtained by APTN, a Mi'kmaq First Nation is taking legal action against Canada after discovering that their commercial fishing license was refuted at the last minute following objections from a non-Indigenous Fishermen's Association and concerns over the, 19, or the 2019 federal election. Angel Moore reports. This is Gaspé Gawagi. It means the last acquired land. Located in the Gaspé region of Quebec, it's a reference to the westernmost part of Mi'kmaq territory. It's also the home of Listigush Mi'kmaq Nation, who have been fishing lobster here since time immemorial. For the last 20 years, they've had a commercial fishery in the spring and food and ceremonial fishery in the fall, where the catch is shared with community members. But under Canadian law, it cannot be sold unlike the commercial fishery. Yet fishing is expensive, gear, fuel, and crew add up. So Listigush developed a plan to sell some of the lobster from the food fishery catch to cover the costs. But it's not an unregulated fishery. It's not an unmanaged fishery. There are principles in the way we manage and govern this fishery. Fred Metallic is director of natural resources in Listigush. He spoke with APTN in 2019 after negotiations for a commercial license for the band's fall food fishery fell apart. But before all the details of what went on behind the scenes fully came to light. Deeply disappointed, disheartened, and, and, and frustrated as well. According to court documents, in 2019, after months of negotiations, Listigush made a tentative deal with the Department of Fisheries a commercial license would be granted for the fall lobster fishery. But at the last minute, the feds pulled out. It does, I think, rattle the confidence of communities when they can get so far in discussions with the DFO only to have them about face at the last minute. It doesn't make for an easy relationship. Listigush lawyer Zachary Davis is representing Listigush in a judicial review, a legal action where a government's decision is challenged before a federal court judge. A paper trail from court documents and an access to information request shows how the commercial fishery deal fell through just one day before the fishery was to begin. And Listigush alleges that political considerations by the Liberal government trumped Mi'kmaq treaty rights. According to court documents, Listigush Chief Darcy Gray was informed over the phone that the 2019 fall commercial license was refused due to electoral and industry concerns. La Gaspésie est empreinte d'une riche tradition de pêche. Meanwhile, DFO emails obtained through access to information show that meetings with a non-Indigenous fishermen's organization from the Gaspé, known as RPPSG, 
reveal their objections against the Listigush fishery. In this meeting summary, the DFO paraphrases the director of RPPSG, O'Neill Clotier, as saying in French that giving Mi'kmaq more fishing rights in the name of reconciliation is discrimination towards whites, and that doing so will lead to an alienation of whites, and concerns that more bands will ask for the same thing. It is unfortunate that Mr. Cloutier feels that he's being victimized here, but he's not the victim. Um, the victim really are the Mi'kmaq communities that were dispossessed of resources that are their ancestral heritage for generations. While Canada does have an obligation to consult industry, the Supreme Court of Canada 1999 decision upheld treaty rights, that the Mi'kmaq have a right to fish to earn a moderate livelihood. It doesn't make sense that I would recognize your right and then quiet your right. Then you're not really recognizing that right. Quite frankly, the Supreme Court was very clear in the Marshall decision that it may result in a disruption to how the fishery is governed now. And that just simply is one of the consequences of the constitutional recognition of treaty rights. Bonjour tout le monde. Emails and court documents also reveal that members of the Gaspé fishermen, including Clotier, met with their local Liberal MP, National Revenue Minister, Diane Le Boutier, one day before the license was refused, and a week after a federal election was called. An election that was a tight race for Le Boutier, she ended up winning by a small margin. Court documents show Cloutier donated over $2,000 to both Le Boutier and the Liberal Party over the years. Le Boutier's communications team says that she's unavailable for comment. We don't think that the DFO gave Listigish reasons for the decision that could justify the infringement of the treaty right. And to a large extent, the reason given, especially in 2019, was concerns of industry, concerns of the RPPSG. DFO declined to comment because the case is before the courts, but reasons given by the Quebec Regional Director General in the court documents cite the concerns of the Gaspé fishermen and the, quote, electoral context. By pointing to electoral guidelines that say during elections, ministers should exercise restraint before making a decision beyond the scope of current affairs. Meanwhile, Listigush argues that electoral guidelines do not have the force of law. How do you move forward in good faith with the minister's office, with the minister of fisheries and oceans, with Canada? If, if reconciliation, recognition of indigenous laws, if partnership are just rhetorical concepts. But that's not to say all negotiations between Listigush and Canada have gone poorly. In April, Listigush signed a five-year deal to develop a fishery to sell a moderate livelihood. We think it's a very progressive deal and hopefully turns a page and allows for you know, better discussions to happen in years to come. Yet, the fall fishery remains unsolved. The Gaspé fishermen declined to comment because the matter is before the courts. Meanwhile, the Listigush Judicial Review is on hold while the judge considers the RPP SG's motion to intervene, meaning that when it comes to the courts possibly setting a legal precedent or nation-to-nation -nation negotiations, the Gaspé Fishermen's Association insists on having a seat at the table. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Tabuktuk, known as Halifax. We need to take another break, but there's still more news ahead, so stay with us. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. William Fowler sent us this beautiful photo near Old Man Creek. That's east of Windfall, Alberta. Cute little moose there. Keep sending us those pictures. You can email them to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's see what's in store for tomorrow's weather forecast. Off to the east coast, we've got 23 in sunshine for Fredericton and Halifax, 19 in cloud for St. John's. 19 in cloud for La Grande River, Kujuac makes a sun of cloud, 15 degrees expected. Set hills, 15 degrees and some showers expected, 25 in sunny in Montreal. Ottawa, 26, lots of sunshine there. Same with London, Ontario. 28th and cloud for Thunder Bay, Capus Casing, cloud 25. 
25 and cloud for Thompson. Puckettawaga 21. Same with Churchill. Sunshine at 28 for Winnipeg. Uh, Barons River 20 with some cloud expected there. 27 in Sunshine for Estevan. 21 in cloud for Saskatoon and North Battleford. 16 in Sunny for Buffalo Narrows. 19 with uh, Mix of Sun and Cloud for LaRange. Mix of Sun and Cloud and 17 for Grand Prairie. Uh, cloud in Priest River is 17 degrees there too. 26 is for Medicine Hut and Lethbridge. Lots of sun down south. 22 in Sunny for Campbell River and Quinnell. 28 in Sunny for Kamloops. Smithers, uh, showers expected, 19 degrees. Uh, some showers too for Fort Nelson and 18 there. Dawson City, sunshine, 27 degrees. 25 up in Old Crow, sunny there too. 25 in Wrigley, sunshine, same with Norman Wells. Yellow Knife, 20 and sunny. Fort McPherson, 24 expected and sunshine there. Polytech, 8 and sun. 15 for Whale Cove with a chance of showers. New Yacht, sunny and 3 degrees. Igloolik, chance of snow and one degree, Pangerton six and cloud. And Indigenous youth along with Treaty One Nations in Manitoba organized a community cleanup at the Thunderbird House in Winnipeg. Volunteers were on site to pick up waste and also offer free lunch to people in need. Here's Daryl Stranger with more. Seven First Nations make up Treaty One territory in Manitoba. On Monday, they, along with 20-year-old event organizer Emily McKinney and Swan Lake First Nation, conducted a community cleanup at the Thunderbird House in downtown Winnipeg. McKinney says a community cleanup like this can show youth the impact caring for others can have. It's our responsibility to take care of our people and it's our responsibility to take care of our environment and, you know, surrounding areas. Whether, you know, if it's just giving out an extra hand or feeding people or picking up trash and such, right? It's our responsibility so that we can, you know, keep this area clean and safe for future generations to come and hopefully make this place a better place to, to be in. Volunteers picked up trash, needles, and offered lunch to those who frequent the area. The Thunderbird House is an indigenous community center in the heart of Winnipeg's inner city. It's used for teaching and sharing traditional Indigenous practices and keeping it clean and safe as a priority. It's really important to us at Treaty 1 because we, the, Winnipeg is obviously situated right in the heart of Treaty 1 and we felt, um, you know, as the original stewards of the land that it would be really important to go out and clean up around uh, the downtown area so that everybody feels welcome to come down. LaGrange also added that they're looking at doing a monthly cleanup at not only the Thunderbird House, but other community sites in the city of Winnipeg that need some care as well. And they're partnering with numerous organizations within the city to make that happen. That's exactly what we're hoping is that this will trigger an ongoing uh, cleanup time, maybe once a month for us to come down and uh, take a, take a uh, cleanup around the, this area, but also into the Forks area. Uh, we know, as, as I mentioned, this is Treaty 1 land, and so we really want to be uh, responsible and proactive in keeping it clean. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. Hopefully that inspires you to organize a cleanup in your own community. Well, we are all out of time for your news tonight. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We are glad you could join us. Have a great night.